You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. So you want to find someone you're compatible with, specifically someone who's ready for a serious connection, totally open to having kids in the future, is a tall rock climbing Libra, and loves rom-coms with vegan pizzas on Tuesdays just as much as you do. Bumble knows that you know exactly what's right for you. So whatever it is you're looking for, Bumble's features can help you find it. Date now on Bumble. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that app. Well, yesterday was quite the day. Um, did a whole big, long thing on uh, the news about Diana Rossini. Now, to be clear, I went out on a little bit of a limb. I, I, I didn't feel like I did because everything I said made infinitely more sense than what I was hearing. Or at least a better way to put that would be everything I was saying about the situation made sense, made the most sense. Not just what was being said, but how it was being said. It all kind of, the whole thing came together as a theory that just totally made sense. And so I went out on a limb and basically just said, yeah, she's lying. If you don't know what I'm talking about, listen to yesterday's episode. And I, that's not even fair. Let, let, me, let me stop there for a second, because I think some people can, can feel like I'm being too harsh. It's not even so much a Diana Rossini issue. I think the biggest issue with her is, is it's one of two things, and I don't know which one it is. Either she genuinely thought she had some really good news and didn't re- this is what I was saying yesterday. She didn't realize that nobody else already knew this stuff. And so there was some kind of ignorance, which is fair because she's not really a Packer fan. Now, maybe she should be up on these things, especially some of the bigger news items, whatever. But, you know, if you cover the NFL, you cover all these different things and you know that there's Rogers drama going on and you know that we're waiting on an announcement. But maybe you don't remember Aaron Rodgers back at, because to be honest, I don't even remember. People have been saying it. I don't remember it even happening, but I've, I'm a Packers podcaster. I'm on Packers Twitter. I see Packers Facebook so I see lots of comments like he said on Pat, he'd be on Pat McAfee, blah, 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 blah. On top of that, you got the, uh, the stuff with Devontae. So, so we can kind of piece these things together because they're beating us over. These are bits of information that are beat us, beating us over the head 24-7. So it's easy to paint this picture. For her, on top of having her own life and everything else, uh, she has 32 teams to cover. Maybe it didn't quite dawn on her that we kind of know it's going to happen probably on Tuesday, if not within two weeks or so, week and a half, I guess, at the absolute most. And even then seems extremely unlikely because then we basically have no time to make a decision on Devante with the news we have about Aaron Rodgers. And so she didn't realize that. She ended up hearing essentially for the first time that the news is going to be coming and it's going to be coming quickly. And that is big news if you didn't know that and you'd assume everybody else would. So you put that on Twitter. So in that case, her issue is Fair or unfair, not really being up on her job. Again, I, not saying it's easy to do, not saying she's bad at her job necessarily, just it was a lack in information about the NFL, which is her job. That's, that's it. Relatively minor, but whatever. The other is she did know the information, and when she heard the news, decided to try to take something that wasn't really news and turn it into news and be extra cryptic so that you can get the extra clicks and the exposure and all that stuff. In that case, I'm not even going to say you're a jerk. I mean, that, that's just stupid. If that's what she did, it was dumb because she didn't really think this through well enough to realize that you're going to get your exposure and during that time of your exposure, you're going to be exposed for not having any information. So I have to assume it's the first one that she just wasn't really aware that this was kind of common knowledge. But the, the bigger issue then beyond that is with, um, and I, I don't even want to, it's, it's everybody from, you know, I don't know who, it doesn't matter, the, the, the people who do what I do. It's the general idea that insiders are, they know everything. And so we treat insiders sort of the same way we would treat Brian Gutekunst. Brian Gutekunst knows everything the Packers are planning to do. Every single thing that they are planning to do, he's aware of. Well, I shouldn't say, you know, obviously Mark Murphy has, he, uh, 
plans about Title Town that Gudikunst maybe isn't fully aware of. And Gudikunst doesn't necessarily know everything that Matt LaFleur has done um, by way of coaching the team meetings and everything. But you get what I'm saying, right? In terms of every single thing to do with contracts, players, um, all, everything offseason related, he is 100% aware. He has to be because he's the guy making the decisions. He's the guy pulling the levers. And so when reporters sit down with him, if, if uh, you know, if I were able to sit down with him, if, if Grassi sat down with him, if any of us, any reporters would ever sit down with him, what you're trying to do is get him to reveal a little bit of the information that he has, which is infinite. It is 100% of the information. He has all of it, and we have very little of it, and we're trying to see how much of that we can get. We treat insiders the same way. We treat insiders the same way as we treat them and pretend that insiders have infinite knowledge of the situations and we're trying to get it out of them. I don't think that anybody actually believes that, but that's, that's the line of questioning for them. The problem is, as I said, if and when they get inside information, the first thing they're going to do is tweet it out. They're going to put it out there. They're going to put it in an article, put it in a tweet, put it in whatever. That is their currency. Information is their currency. They're going to give it out. And so asking them to elaborate on situations, asking them, you know, occasionally they might know something else or, or maybe they left a little bit behind or, or whatever. But generally speaking, you know, maybe you can jog their memory about other conversations that have been going on that you, you either have been kind of holding back because you want more information or whatever, and maybe you'll reveal it, whatever. But generally speaking, they don't have any more information. They don't know what else is going on out there beyond what they've already told us. And so Diana was put in a tough spot where she tweeted out something that seemed like it was nothing, but we weren't really sure. And we were kind of curious, is there more to this? And it became very clear there wasn't more to this. And Rich Eisen is sitting there treating her as though she's the GM of the Green Bay Packers, trying to get more, you know, as, as though it's Aaron Rodgers, right? Aaron Rodgers is another one. Obviously, Aaron Rodgers knows everything there is to know about Aaron Rodgers. And so Pat McAfee's trying to maybe get him to say a little something. Trying to get some answers on it. Well, you know, maybe you're leaning a little bit, or maybe you know this or that, or what do you what do you got going on, man? I know you didn't make a decision, but you're maybe leaning or something, right? So that's generally my biggest issue with these things. Now, Ian Rappaport, I feel like a lot of times, for example, when you see on NFL Net, he'll tweet something and then he'll do a video. And the video is a slight elaboration on his tweet because tweet is limited characters, but he's just going to lay out exactly what he knows, and that's it. But the point is, there's no follow up questions. You don't follow up and be like, okay, so tell me, like, wh why is Gutekunst doing this? How does he know? If he knew, he would have said it in his little monologue. And so there, there's kind of just a system, and, and I don't really see it changing all that much. I mean, this situation might change things for um, Diana a little bit in terms of, I don't want to be in this situation again, so I need to really think these things through. And if you're trying to interview these people, you might want to think about do I have any questions that they can actually answer? And look, I, I feel like Rich Eisen did as good of a job as he could possibly do if you assume that they, she probably doesn't have any more information. You lob up some softballs, let her just give her opinion, pretend it's some kind of inside information. But again, the bigger issue here, and Aaron Rodgers has done a masterful job of completely dismembering all of this stuff. Because the thing is, this is the kind of stuff that's been going on forever, but there's always been such a tight-lipped ecosystem around the NFL. Like, Coaches and players don't really talk. Occasionally, there'll be a um, you know a press conference or something, and it'll be brought up, and they might kind of give some kind of an evasive, like eh, you know, that's not you know. I, I, usually, they can't comment on it, but maybe they'll kind of say, I don't know where they're getting their information or whatever, which isn't really a, a denial. And then you know, the 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 media guys will come out even stronger and be like, well, that is the situation. Whether he went, you know, they, they'll come out real hard as though they hold the cards here. And they don't. And so with Aaron Rodgers and now other players starting to become emboldened by this, they're just destroying these people. That took over the whole world. And the thing is, you wait for this thing to blow up. You wait for the entire NFL landscape to understand this and embrace this. And, and so everybody's under this understanding. And then you drop the, nope, that's not true. And it blows the whole thing up. And you see this, this entire structure that the media is built on right now largely is fake. And it really hurts people like, you know, Ian and, and Schefter and Rossini, because the only thing that has any credibility in that entire ecosystem are insiders. And if the people who are insiders are losing their credibility, that's bad. When the only thing you've contributed to is a complete and utter lie, because rather than actually conveying information as it is, you start, because remember, that's where she got hurt. The, the one bit of information she had is that the report is coming soon. 
Everybody already knows that. Rogers didn't refute that. But then she got caught up trying to make things up to make it sound like she knows more than she does because she's being put on the spot by Rich Eisen. So she kind of makes something up based on some information she's heard, which again, I think she got wrong. And that's the thing she got caught by. Should have never been down there anyways. There never should have been this interview, but they feel like they can't just let this go. This is a massive cash cow. All eyes are on Diana Rossini right now. If I can get her on my show, all eyes will turn to me. It's an attention game. I'm in the attention game. I want everybody to look at me. I need you to. If I could get, you know... Pat McAfee viewers to, to turn to me. If he could if he could just talk about me one time, he's got 100,000 people watching his stream on Tuesday. If he mentions my podcast, that's 100,000 people that for at least one brief second will be thinking about me, and maybe some of them want to check out my podcast. That is massive for me. It's an attention game. We're all playing the attention game. And so when all attention is on one area, we try to draw that to us. The problem is you're going to end up getting hurt by that more than anything. Rossini and Rich Eisen's reputation got hurt by this. If you don't know what I'm talking about, um, because there there was some some news here. I, I I was planning on playing this right away, even before the music. But then I was like, no, nah, it's kind of too long of a clip. Let me just preface it, and then I'll play it. And then I got caught up just saying, I'm going to say the whole thing right now. But on Pat McAfee's show, he just asked. There's a report out there. $50 million is what you're asking for. Is that true? And the entire world ran with this. Ran with this. You had better be very careful dropping opinions based on rumors about Aaron Rodgers because you are going to get yourself hurt. Here is what happened yesterday. There, that leads to that clip, because it's good internet, being put onto the internet, okay? And if you look at the reaction of that, now there's people quote tweeting this uh, tweet that they put out. Peter Bukowski, who covers the Green Bay Packers. Mm -hmm. Packers fans love to get mad at Greg Jennings, but he's right about the disconnect between Rodgers wanting 50 million and wanting to keep key guys like Adams, okay? So he has big time following, by the way. 34,000 mm -hmm. Packers fans follow him, so that's a lot of fans obviously on the internet if he wants his fit we don't know if he wants 50 million dollars right. peter bukowski quotes we did greg jennings burying aaron Rodgers from a source that was from around the league yesterday anonymously on rich eisen's show he's not the only one that quote tweets this obviously nick wright the host of the show quote tweets this to amplify this and nick wright in the middle of the whole can you tell me that personal story about how terrible of a person he is because we have the opportunity to do that right now because there's an anonymous source that said something that we have no idea if it's true or not so that leads ultimately to packer fans and fans in general having an opinion about Aaron Rodgers. Greg here at Pac-Man GDI. He has like 2,000 followers. I checked him out. I assume he's just a Packers fan at Pac-Man. I back Greg Jennings on this 100%. Aaron Rodgers is a prime example of wanting to have your cake and eat it too. Okay, so the narrative that they wanted to build worked, right? I don't mm -hmm. know. Pac-Man oh, yeah. probably hasn't liked Aaron at all uh, for a long time. But whenever you're hearing these terrible things about somebody, you can easily see, oh, I f and hate this guy. With that being said, I understand people are going to say that I go to bat for Aaron because he's a friend of mine. I do. But for a long time, narratives like this have just gone unchecked about this dude. And everybody has kind of let the snowball, boom, 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 prima donna, mm -hmm. arrogant, standoffish has become down there. And we try to stop it. So I do, and he doesn't need us to go to bat for him, by the way. No. He's made hundreds of millions of dollars. Oh, right. He's a very successful person. He has business ventures. He does his thing. And, you know, he will poop and puke at the same time, make his body feel better. That's yes. right. So I just thought, you know, has anybody just thought about, like, maybe just asking him? So I text him. <laughs> That's not true. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> all of that stuff this morning about ruining him. And I don't normally do this, by the way. I, I, don't, I wouldn't normally text right. Aaron. I know where I don't think we're that. Like, I don't want to interrupt his life. We obviously get along. We're obviously right. mm -hmm. friendly with each other. But like every single report I'm not going to do, I send him, hey, man, uh, reports whether you want to be the highest paid player by a wide margin, whatever. Is that the thing that you are currently like stumping for? Like, is that what's going on right now? And categorically false is what I was and it's just insane to think about that the amount of fans that heard Greg Jennings, former mm -hmm. teammate, bring up all these. By the way, Greg Jennings and Aaron, they, they can figure out. Uh, I'm, right. not, I'm yeah. not getting in the middle of that. Different story. But the entire narrative of it all is already run. And it's a, a whole cycle almost on the Internet. And it just feeds to the fact that this guy's a f When he might be, but I don't know. He talks to us for like an hour every mm -hmm. single week during the season. I feel like we've learned a lot about him. A lot of people that are, you know, like four-time MVPs might have a little in them every once in a while, but I don't think the narrative about all this is anywhere near accurate just strictly because what I was told from my source 
And it just doesn't make any sense to me. This is how it's always been, though, with him, right? All right. So that was that was what we found out, which, again, and, and, and this is good for social media, too, for all of us. You need to tread lightly out there. Now, if you want to stake your claim and, and, and say something, fine. But um, at the very least, you need to be on high alert for BS reporting. And you, you guys know, I, I said, you know, I, I was not anti Schefter like everybody else was last year because I think what he said was true. How do I know? Because everybody acknowledged that it was true after the fact. So it's not that every report is nonsense and everything is fake and they're all lying and it's all. No. But at the very least, you got to be aware that some of this stuff is there, there's, there's different, there's gradations here. There's lying which I don't think Ian Schefter, Rossini, I don't think they necessarily lie. Not to say that they wouldn't, because it's a cutthroat business. If, if you got to lie to get ahead, lie to get ahead, do what you got to do. And, and, and they do lie to an extent, right? Her, you know, sort of white lies or uh, sort of fibbing where you pretend to know something that you don't or, or, or take an opinion and make it sound like a fact. That's technically lying, but that's not where we're just talking about flat out made up a story. Like what I did on Twitter when it kind of blew up, just made that up. Fake. Then there's sort of filling in the blanks. That's what Diana did. That's what Schefter did. Schefter didn't know everything that he said. He filled in the blanks. So we're kind of making educated guesses, and there's nothing wrong with educated guesses. The biggest issue I have with educated guesses is they make it seem as though it's a fact. Because they kind of have to. Because anybody can make an educated guess. Although you don't really have to. You have information that we don't have. Diana did not. So she kind of had to just lie. But for example, with the Schefter thing, it would have been very easy to say, here's the information that I've had for a long time, and here's the conclusion that I, here's what I think is happening. And I think it would have been a lot better. Look, I, I don't have knowledge of, of for sure anything is about to happen, but I'm, I'm releasing this news now because I get the impression that, and this is why I think that. And give the backstory. For months, we've been hearing this. We know about this, and, and you know, it hasn't been reported yet. But this is going on, and, and there's reports about this. And so I just, I just want to clear the air, right? Just clear the air. Here's all the information. A lot of us guys have had this, and we've held on to this, and we haven't really said anything yet. Here's what we know. And the reason you need to know now is because the draft is about to happen, and there's rumors about phone calls being made. And so if anything big happens, just want you to know this, that, or the other. Now, he, he's kind of lying about that because essentially I'm, I'm making up lies for him. But that would essentially be kind of, because obviously it's self-serving, right? I wanted to be the first. I wanted to scoop it, whatever. But at least just be honest about what you know and what you don't know. That's another issue. By the way, when I was watching that clip, I was having a heart attack because I know I had made some comments about uh, when Rogers, when that first thing came out, I, I made some kind of a comment about no chance I would want him for $50 million. I didn't say the report was true. I'm just saying I wouldn't want him for $50 million. And I was like, man, if Pat pulls me up here, and uses me as, as an example, which I'm sure somebody would have told me, but uses me as an example of some, uh, you know, out of touch Packer fan that just runs with information. Like, please don't do that, dude. I, I, I nailed this. I got it right. Please don't just kill me right now. I, I, I got out of that one. But anyways, all that to say, I freaking told you, man. <laughs> all the, think about all the attention that got. You don't need any of that stuff. You just need me. That's it. Just come on over. I got your back. Anyways, why don't we just take a break here? Um, we'll come back, talk about some other stuff. Don't forget to head over to my Twitter to uh, find the fundraiser for Drew to help him get his seizure service dog. Um, thanks very much to Ken and JJ for uh, your donations over the last two days. Very much appreciated. Also, head over to the Packernet Podcast Facebook group. Pinned to the top there, you'll find the GoFundMe for Cody. Uh, it's actually for Jamie and Carter, but it, Cody is the one that reached out. He is, uh, again, a uh, friend of the show. But uh, Jamie and Carter were in a head-on collision, and so Cody needs some expenses to be able to not only cover costs, but to just for travel and things to be able to be able to take care of them. Um, so we're trying to raise money for that as well. And we've had several in the last uh, few days. Bethany Curtis, an anonymous $200 donor, as well as Darla and Dana have all donated. So... Obviously, not all those are going to be listeners, but thank you anyways to everybody that's given. Don't forget about amodernfrontier.com. You can buy yourself an eighth, eighth, why is it so hard for me to say this? One eighth grass-fed beef box, one quarter pastured pork box, or you can just go get a butcher's dozen ground beef. Remember, use promo code MEATPACKER. That's one word, all caps. You're going to get $25 off your order. If you have any questions, head over to the website, send them a message, and they'll get back to you. We'll take a break. We'll be right back.
Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal, independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So we've got kind of a lot coming up here. Um, On Tuesday, obviously you all know that supposedly Aaron Rodgers is going to be making some kind of a a big announcement. Um, You've also got Matt LaFleur and Brian Gutekunst scheduled for press conferences, um, and that might have something to do with the fact that also on Tuesday, that is the first day of the NFL scouting combine. Now, there's not a ton going on the first day. The way the combine works is they stagger. So um, you've got four different groups. You've got tight end quarterback and wide receiver. The next group is offensive line running back. The next group is defensive line linebacker. The next group is DB, place kicker, special teams. And then they stagger by day. So the first day is registration, your pre-exam, your orientation, and some interviews. Now, the interviews are not useless. That's important, and hopefully we get a little bit of information on that. But the point is, the first group comes in the first day and does the first thing. So the first day, it's actually Monday. It says it's... uh, whatever, but it's actually on Monday. So Monday, February 28th, the tight ends, quarterbacks, and wide receivers are going through the registration, pre-exam, orientation, interview process. The second day, that group goes on to phase two, which is medical exams, which everybody says is the most important part of this. It's not the 40 time. It's not the bench press. Apparently not even the interviews. It's the medicals because that's make or break for their prospects. If you got an entire board, if they got some medical issues, that changes everything. Um, and then potential special studies. I don't know what that means, but uh, more additional interviews. But on Tuesday, March 1st, while the tight end quarterback wide receiver group is moving into phase two, the outside line running back group is starting with phase one. So as of Monday, there's nothing really going on that we're going to be privy to. As of Tuesday, there's nothing going on. Then Wednesday, March 2nd, the tight ends, quarterbacks, and wideouts are on day three, which is media additional interviews, ortho exam, and NFLPA meeting. So at least there's some media for some of these guys. So we'll be able to see a little bit of something. Again, outside linebacker running back moves into phase two. Defensive line linebackers are in phase one. And then the fourth group, DB, place caper, special teams aren't going to do anything until Thursday. But Thursday, March 3rd, is when the tight ends, quarterbacks, and wideouts are going to be starting with measurements, bench press, and on-field workouts. So that's the kind of stuff that we're obviously most interested in. So Thursday, we're going to be able to see tight ends, quarterbacks, and wide receivers. On Friday, we're going to be seeing offensive line and running backs do their workouts. Um, On Saturday, you got defensive line and linebackers. And then on Sunday, you've got um, the other guys. So there's some question as to whether or not I'd be able to do some kind of a stream. Um, The only ones I would be able to do probably would be defensive line and linebacker, which isn't as exciting. I mean, I guess who cares? You could do it, but... I just don't know if I want to. Um, 
the NFL draft is extremely exhausting, and that's incredibly interesting. Um, I could maybe do this. It's just it's one of those things you get excited for, and then as it goes, it just goes so slow, and it's all day. So I might do something. I don't really know, but um, obviously I have to work on Thursday and Friday, and then Sundays are usually not good for me to be able to do stuff either. Saturday is really my only free day of the week, and that's assuming there's nothing going on that day, which is never a guarantee. That's why I'm so hard to work with sometimes, because it's like, you know, I'll get back to you Saturday. Yeah, we should do that. Saturday. When do you want to do this? Saturday. <laughs> Literally have no other days. And if there's anything going on that Saturday, I uh, next week, I guess. So again, there, there is a good amount going on in the next several days. Um, almost reminds me of the end of the off season, or at least, you know, the, you know, the, the ending portion when the team starts to come back and they're doing all this stuff and it's like, all right, man, now real stuff's about to happen. And it's like, yeah, well, we've got like a week of meetings and we're going to be doing stuff. And basically you have no, so we're doing things, but you're not going to know about any of it. So then it's like, oh crap. So next week is a big week. We got hopefully some Rogers news. We'll have the interview with uh, LaFleur and Gutekunst. And again, I would love it if we had more draft related things, but assuming there's a big announcement, I doubt they're going to even be talking about it at all. Um, Every question is going to be pertaining to the Aaron Rodgers situation and Devontae Adams and a little bit of this, that, and the other thing, and Zadarius and blah, blah, blah. But anyways, um, after Tuesday, we'll have plenty to talk about. And then starting again Thursday, we've got a lot going on here. And, and again, there's interviews going on. There's media availability starting Wednesday. The interviews start Monday. So as of Monday, we've got the Green Bay Packers sitting down with tight ends, quarterbacks, and wide receivers quarterback's probably not going to be as big of a deal, but tight ends and wide receivers, obviously. So hopefully we'll have some reports about um, prospects that the Packers have met with, sat down with. You start to hear about rumors flying around. Again, I don't know how much of those are true or not, but it's fun to engage with all of them and, and just see, you know, start building out narratives and understandings of things based on different things that you hear over time. So should be a good week. I know there's a lot going on right now. Um, I know it's it's hard to talk about football and with all the stuff going on. Um, not sure where you're at with it, but it just causes for me a lot of reflection and thought and um, a lot of what if in terms of what this means for us. Um, spent a large portion of my drive home thinking about, you know, I saw a video of a soldier saying goodbye to his daughter. His wife and daughter were getting on a train and he was staying behind to help defend Ukraine, knowing full well that he's probably not going to survive that. So he's saying goodbye to his daughter forever. And it just kind of, you know, it just, it just puts you in a place like I've never, my mind has never had to go there before. You know, all the, all the security I have and everything that I take for granted, it's not real, you know? It's weird. It, it just, it, I still can't quite comprehend all of that. You know, it's, it's like, well, that's what they go through over there. That's not our reality. That's not, but, but it, it could be, it could be, you know? So I don't know. I, I, I haven't really been able to process exactly what it is I'm trying to process, but you know, it just it forces you to think about stuff that, um, now again, we, we, we take a lot of the stuff for granted. So it's a big part of the reason why I've been so angry at Americans in general constantly complaining about everything. Everything, 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 everything. We're scared of everything. We have to fight about everything. And it's like, we have nothing to complain about. We are the whiniest. It's like, all you have to do is shut your mouth, mind your business, and go enjoy your life. That's all you have to do. But we cause just controversy over every, everything's a big deal. Everything's a big controversy. No, it's not. We don't have controversy. We don't have problems. <laughs> I mean, we have problems as a part of being a part of life. Struggle, pain, all that stuff. But, but you, you, you need to acknowledge that's life and move on. But we just can't do it over here. We're so weak and pathetic. We got to cry about everything. I mean, just, just look at what happened with the Aaron Rodgers situation in terms of him being immunized instead of vaccinated and how people reacted in the context of Ukraine. Is all that anger justified? Do you think? Do you think it was worth that much time and effort? All the people that are just furious with him, the people that want him off the Packers because, the people that refuse to vote for him for MVP because. And again, I did a whole episode on how that guy's not alone. There's a lot of people that agree with that sentiment. He should not win MVP because of his stance on something. So again, I'm, I'm at least hopeful that most of us are able to sit and reflect and, and really start trying to be grateful for things, not hating every single person for the most ridiculously mundane things. 
You have neighbors that have different political beliefs than you, but you know what? They're not pointing a gun at you. They're not shooting at you and your children. There are not missiles ripping through your home. You're not walking down the street seeing your neighbors strewn about the street. They just have different beliefs about the course of action that would be best for our country. That's it. That's the whole thing. And you can't handle that? It's kind of pathetic. So, again, take some time. I'm obviously doing it, and I don't think we really have a choice. I mean, it's, you know, maybe some people are able to disconnect better than others, but for a lot of us, myself included, it's just, it's on the forefront of your mind no matter what. And I can see it. You know, I, I can see in the numbers just a sharp drop off since the invasion. I have had, it's, it's been three days, and there is just a, you can just see three days of just, <laughs> I mean, I can see where it happened. Um, so I, I completely understand it. But fortunately, we have a lot of distractions coming up and things. And um, I really think there has been a lot of positive. First of all, Ukraine has stood stronger than, than I expected when this whole thing started. It looked like it, it was going to be over in a day. But uh, they are a extremely strong and resilient people. Um, they're winning a lot, a lot of battles that never expected to win. In fact, they were not, uh, I think, the the leader of Ukraine was not expecting to survive the night, and he did. And, and they won and have stayed strong. Uh, kudos to um, the president of Ukraine, by the way, who has decided to stay back and fight um, in the middle of the fierce battle over uh, Kiev. Apparently, the United States offered to evacuate him, and he said, no, I'm staying. He's another one that fully expects to not survive very much longer. He knows that. He knows that when the U.S. said, we will get you out, and he said, no, that he's not going to survive this, but he stayed. It's really, uh, it's really eye-opening to, to see how they're reacting to this, because I, I know as Americans, we, we don't really share a lot of the same values. We've gotten so far away from believing in, in things that are bigger than ourselves. I mean, that's, that's been a major movement since I was a child, is to get away from that, you know. Um, religion in general, something bigger than yourself. We've moved far away from that. Uh, believing in your country being bigger than yourself, something to defend, something to stand up for is, is mocked and ridiculed. Religion is mocked and ridiculed. Anything, and family in general, as being a, a central thing in which you need to sacrifice. Any, anything in which you should sacrifice yourself is, is not a core tenant in this country anymore. We, we believe that you are the most important thing and you need to focus on you. And so watching the Ukrainians do the exact opposite and staying and dying. I mean, there was the, the video, and, and again, I just can't even conceptualize it. As an American, I don't understand it, but there was a video of a group of people on an island, and they were, you know, setting up a, a watch for this island. They have no recourse to defend themselves, and there was a, a radio transmission, essentially, if you haven't seen the video, in which the, uh, a, a Russian battleship or, or some kind of a ship was outside saying, throw down your arms, surrender, we're essentially, we are going to take this. If you don't do that, we're going to shell the island and we'll destroy you and everything on it. And all you hear is somebody saying, this is it. And then he turns the volume up and says into the microphone, Russian battleship, go f*** yourself. And they died. Why? You know, I, I just, I, I can't wrap my head around Why? Because it's something worth dying for. I just, I, I, you know what I mean? I can't win. Okay, you got me. Take the island, not my island. Screw this island. Never like this island. I'm out of here. I, I'm not even supposed to be here. I was vacationing here. I, I got a tent set up on the other side. I'm just trying to get out of here. I'll see you later. I don't need this stupid island. Nobody fighting in Ukraine right now expects to live. They don't expect to win the battle. It's sad that we've lost that here. It's sad that we've become a nation that says that being selfish is the most important virtue. You're more important than your family. You're more important than your kids. You're more important than your country. You're certainly more important than some fictitious god in the sky. And we've torn down any and all institutions that are meant to be important. Any concept of national pride is mocked. You know, it, it even used to be that the, the whole thing was that you don't talk ill of the president just because you respect the institution. We don't do that anymore because it's silly. Everything has been brought down to rubble. All, all the, the pillars of society have been brought down to nothing so that we can amplify ourselves to be the most important things. And it's not a good thing. And so I've been certainly um, impressed does not, does not really sum it up, but I, I'll, I'll say that because I can't think of anything else. I'm, I've been impressed to the point of not even being able to comprehend what the Ukrainians are doing. The level of courage, the level of pride, the level of humility. Just the ability to stand up and say, I know I'm not going to survive this, but some things are bigger than me. It's inspiring. And it breaks my heart because you look at it and you, you pity them, but after seeing it, I kind of pity us a little bit. We don't have what they have. 
We have money, we have freedom, we have the ability to do whatever we want, but we're dead inside. We don't have anything to fight for because we tore everything down. We don't believe in anything anymore except ourselves and what we want and what we think is important and what offends us and what I want and how everybody should conform to what I want. That's, that is the United States and it's sad and it's pathetic. It's also been great to see the world um, rally around Ukraine. Um, it's, it's disheartening knowing that nobody's going to actually do anything as far as, as um, stepping in out of fear of retaliation um, and escalation. I'm not even necessarily saying we should, and it's, it's hard to, as we all sit by and just watch it happen. But um, I mean, I've never seen, for example, like Afghanistan step up and be like, dude, Russia, chill. <laughs> you know, I think it was like literally the Taliban or something set out a statement like, you guys are, you should probably cool it. Like, what? You know, a lot of uh, countries, obviously China's a, a lost cause. They're not going to step in and do anything to help or, or even say a, an ill word about Russia. I think it was China, India, and uh, Saudi Arabia that refused to partake in the denouncing of Russia. But um, everyone else is, is getting involved and are, are doing things at least semi-sacrificially. Nations that, you know, are much smaller than the United States that are right on the border of Russia that are basically going toe-to-toe -to -toe saying, I'm not going in there. But um, yeah, I'm cutting you off. And Russia's threatening to wipe them off the earth. And they're like, meh. Oh, well, you're a jerk. I'm not dealing with you. Do what you got to do. It's great to see the uh, uprisings of support from around the world. Chicago, London, Latvia, even in Russia, people are, are willing to sacrifice themselves to protest, which is a big deal because, number one, the massive amounts of propaganda in Russia that portray the Russians as the good guys, um, to be able to parse through that and realize that that isn't the case. But on top of that, knowing full well that, I mean, with that government, they, they can, I mean, who knows what the punishment's going to be. It's not going to be pretty. And again, you know, you know, you're not going to change anything. You know that you protesting out there is going to hurt you and help nothing, but it's bigger than you. And as a result of a group of people saying, I'm willing to sacrifice myself for something that isn't going to fix the problem, we end up seeing visuals of thousands of people marching in Russia because of self-sacrifice, because of acknowledging some things are bigger than me. It's hard for us to wrap our head around it because it's not rational, but it's also undeniable. It's undeniable how important it is, and it's undeniable how destructive it is when we tear these things down. Whether we can rationalize it or not, there's something there. There's something important about being a part of something and believing in something. Oh, it's just a stupid flag. Oh, it's just the da 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 Why should I have to be a slave to my family or whatever? You know, what, just nonsense that we keep hearing. It's just undeniable. It's undeniable to me what I'm, what I'm watching is, is something good. And everything I see that's good is, is about sacrifice. And everything I see that is wrong is self-interest. And although our lives are not at the scale of full-on war, the truth of that is real even in our homes. All this peace and security is, is a good thing, but it's caused a lot of problems because we've lost all perspective. We've lost any reason to care about anything but ourselves. We've got to turn that around. I don't know how that's going to happen, but we got to change that. I was just sitting in my car yesterday thinking, you know, I, not that I think it's going to happen, but what if things really got out of control? What if this really was World War III? What if they just opened up the doors and said, we're asking for people to come and fight? Would I go? Or could I sit at home and play with my kids and just hope that other people will go do it and fight the war and win so that I can be, continue to be comfortable at home with my family? Or would I actually go and fight so that my kids wouldn't have to, so that they can be home safe? So... Again, I understand that uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to think about outside of football. And so, again, I, I see the numbers are down. I don't expect them really to, to bounce back. I know when, when, um, when times like this get tough, whether it be COVID or whatever, there, there's always a dip, and I completely understand it. Just don't waste it. If you're going to go away, don't just go away to be miserable. Really reflect and figure out how this is going to make you better. Anyways, there's, there's other stuff to talk about, but I'm just, you know, I think we're good. You know, it's, it's a Saturday and we'll, we'll, we'll just leave it at this. But um, I think we're going to sign off today with something a little bit different. This is, uh, there's a lot of fights going on all around Ukraine. One of the places in which there's been some intense battles is a place called Sumy. Um, been a lot of battling and, and uh, in the midst of the battle, there was uh, somebody who was <clears throat> playing the national anthem just out in the streets. So, you know, it's, impressive again just the resilience that um that we're seeing so you guys have a great day and um i'll talk to you tomorrow have a good one bye bye Slava Ukraine!